downtown, Peckle Park, a new beginning, let's go. Started back rocking the brown. Ever since we've been knocking them down. Knocking them down. Baby said she wanna go to the game. To the game. Taught her how to say Padre gang. Started back rocking the brown. Rockin the brown. Ever since we've been knocking them down. Knockin them down. Mitchell and Ness with the old school name. All of the homies holla Padre gang. Yeah, they Welcome, everybody, to episode 234 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. I'm your host, Ben Fadden. This is being recorded on Monday, by the way. It'll go out tomorrow on Tuesday, September 20th, uh, before the Padres take on the Cardinals. Uh, I am joined today by NBC7's Derek Togerson. We're going to talk about two teams today. Uh, Padres, most of the episode, obviously, because it's the Padres show. But then we'll touch on the wave uh, a little bit at the end. Derek? First off, thank you so much for hopping on. Oh, no problem, man. Thanks for inviting me. Always good to talk to you. Yeah, so, all right. First off, we'll start with the offense here. Uh, I think, obviously, a big story this past weekend was Juan Soto. Um, it's been really, really tough for him with the Padres, at least, you know, offensively at the plate. Just hasn't been himself. But it looks like he's found it. Um, more confident. He's not grounding balls to the pitcher. It's... A lot of opposite line drives we saw, uh, I think it was Friday, whenever that was. And he, he liked that more than like the RBI single he had that night. So when he is going, you know, he was hitting three for 33 entering, I think, the Arizona series, finished it with a home run, uh, five hits in those last three games. How much of a positive effect of a positive, positive effect, excuse me, uh, does he have on the lineup as a whole all up and down when he is hitting well? Well, he changes your entire complexity of the lineup. You know, a lot of people don't believe in, you know, line protection in the lineup or right. whatever phrase you want to use, but he impacts everybody because if he's on base, you have to pitch a little bit, you know, closer to Manny Machado. You can't just pitch around him. You have to give him some because now you're going to put somebody else on because now you have the possibility for two runners on base and then somebody else in the lineup can hurt you. He's uh, with no pitcher now. You can turn the lineup over. He's an RBI threat. He does. He makes it so difficult on pitchers because he's able to work counts. And what he wasn't doing earlier is he was getting hittable pitches. He just wasn't hitting them. Like the OPS right. is, is fine. He was walking. He, was, he wasn't going outside the strike zone, which to me is a bigger problem. When you start expanding the zone and you lose your eye, that means that you're pressing too much. What he was doing was when he got his pitches in the zone, he was trying to hit them 9,000 feet, mm -hmm. trying to hit six-run home runs. He doesn't need to do that. All he needs to do is put the barrel on the ball and it will travel because he's such a naturally gifted hitter. And you're right. When he starts using the entire field, that's when Juan Soto is locked in and that is most dangerous because then there's no place. He's not going to swing at a ball. So you're going to walk him. But there's also no place in the strike zone that you can get him out. And that's a very, very dangerous man. And that I think that's the zone he's entering into right now. Yeah, because you talk about the top of the lineup and I know he, he helps the bottom of it too because it extends it. Um, you know, get runners on base, and now all of a sudden, the six hitter, if there's two outs in an inning or something, that's still a tough situation for the pitcher, as you know, if unless there was or going back when Soto uh, wasn't doing so well, maybe you had the bases empty. Uh, it's just a different situation. Uh, but with the top of the order, even Profar, right? He's kind of been struggling. Uh, I think they should think about having Jose Azokar try some games in the leadoff spot. What do you think about that? Uh, and just going off that Soto point, that top of the order with even Profar struggling, like the pitcher knows, hey, I'm going to attack Profar. So Profar eventually I would think would get out of it because uh, you want to get him out at least before you can get to Soto and Manny. Yeah, I, at this point, why not, right? Mm -hmm. You haven't been able to fix your leadoff hitter pretty much all year. I mean, Profar had that nice stretch where he was playing real well. But that's just been his whole career. He's been streaky. And he happened to be streaky in the leadoff spot in that particular spot. And uh, and now it's who who do you have? Grisham hasn't been able to do it. Kim hasn't really been able to consistently do it. Um, they tried Austin Nola <laughs> their yeah. one game. It, they, they don't have – they were hoping Tatis to come out and fill that role. Obviously, they know that's not going to happen. So, at this point, why don't we kick the tires on Azokar? You know, he's shown a couple of really good at-bats, a really good plate appearances. He's worked a couple of really good walks. I mean, look at, at one of the big rallies they had at Petco Park for a walk-off. He worked a great walk. Um, he had a really good at-bat where he pulled his hands in, and Mark Grant on the broadcast really illustrated this. How more, he pulled his hands in just to fight a ball off to get, to get a single to center field. He's not a guy who's going to try and do 
do too much. Obviously, he doesn't hit the ball out of the ballpark, so he's not going to go out of his shoes trying to do that. I think Profar does that at times. I think Kim does that at times. I guarantee you Grisham does that a lot of the mm-hmm. time. You got a guy who can just get on base. Why not? You know, roll, roll the dice. You might you might stumble into something that you didn't even know you had. Right. Where do you where, where do you think Grisham's role is? Uh, if Azokar indeed is the starting center fielder, because it definitely seems like he's the starting center fielder now playing uh, even against lefties uh, or excuse me, against righties on back to back days during this Diamondback series. Is Grisham like that late game defensive replacement somewhere? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what he is. He, yeah. He's he's your he's your um, sometimes against a tough righty. He gets the start and he's your late inning defensive replacement, just like they were doing with the four shortstops when they still had Eric right. Osmer. Um, when they did the late inning defensive moves, Christian becomes basically that where he comes in, maybe uh, bring, you know, Myers or, or Soto's actually made some really good defensive plays. I know mm-hmm. he's had a couple of lapses, but he's, I think, been really good compared to his career standard, a very good defensive outfielder since the trade. So you just, you, you put an extra guy with some speed out there. You maybe move him in the left or Zokar in the left when, right. when you got Myers out there. And that and that's your late in the inning defensive guy. And you're kind of spot against a tough righty uh, starter in the outfielder. That's, that's kind of what Trent Grisham has played himself into right now. And another guy that's, I think, kind of played himself more positively, not negatively onto the bench, but more positively into more playing time is probably Luis Camposano, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy... It's limited, but especially we know he should be catching Musgrove from now on. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, but obviously he homered on Saturday. He's doing better, I think, in the playing time that he's gotten than someone like Austin Nola. Uh, nothing against Nola, but he doesn't. he's not as much of a power threat, I don't think, as Camposano is. Doesn't seem to throw guys out. I'm not saying Camposano is going to throw everyone out. But I think it's worth a shot to try Camposano more games than just Musgrove starts. Well, Camposano obviously is the best offensive option of the three. Mm-hmm. Um, he defensively, he's got the strongest arm. He and Alfaro are probably are right there because, you know, Jorge, when he lets it loose, he's he's got a cannon. Yeah. Defensively, um, calling a game, that's something that comes with experience. So he's not as good as Nola right now. I'm not sure he blocks as well as Nola does as, as well. The pitch framing thing, I don't think any of the Padres catchers right now are particularly fantastic. They're not bad, but they're not great at the pitch framing thing. So that's kind of a wash. If Alfaro, and by the way, I will say this, I believe Jorge Alfaro needs a lifetime contract with the Padres. He's just the coolest dude. Every time he walks through the clubhouse, he just fist bumps everybody, media, you know, club personnel. He's he's the most positive, nicest guy you're ever gonna meet. And and what he does in the ninth inning is fantastic. Just mm-hmm. let that guy stay for as long as he wants. 92 years, let him be the Tom Brady of the Padres. You want to play for your 50? Great. You can play to your 50. We'll keep you on the roster. Fantastic. But if his knee is still acting up on him a little bit. I don't see why you don't have Camposano getting three, maybe four starts a week right now, because you're right. If he's going to be your best option moving forward, he has to get familiarity with Darvish. He has to get familiarity with Snell, because obviously those are your three guys in the playoffs. If you're, if you're if we're starting right now, it's obviously you, Darvish, Joe Musgrove, Blake Snell, are your starters in, in the postseason. So if you're going to get him some more familiarity with them because you want that offensive threat up and down the lineup, start doing it now so they can have some kind of a rapport as you move forward in the postseason. Yeah, I think I'm not even asking the Padres to have Campy catch when Darvish is pitching. Like, that's a lot to ask. Uh, Nola knows, you know, how to go about that. Obviously, that that's Darvish is so unique. I'm not asking that. I'm just asking more consistently uh, when other guys are starting uh, other than Darvish. Um, With Jorge Alfaro, you already mentioned him there. Is he kind of like a pinch hit role? It feels to me like Nola and Campy should be getting most of the catching time so is it dh sometimes but then you have bell and myers as well or drury so it's just kind of he's going to get some limited time i think kind of like grisham now he's a, he's a dh option for sure drury is the real interesting case here i mean look at that game on i believe it was friday night he makes a really good catch playing first base going yep. up against the the rail and then he goes and plays third 
because well, that was, no, it was a game where they, they just you know, blew out the Diamondbacks. It was the 12 to 12 to whatever it was mm-hmm. game. So Manny came out and he moves over to third. He makes another catch, really good one up over on the other side. He can play multiple spots and obviously he, he can certainly DH. So he gives you a lot of uh, options when you're talking about defensive flexibility. And obviously the dude is having a career year with the bat and he was a fantastic addition by and a surprise one by AJ Preller at the deadline. He might be the dude who kind of kickstarts this whole offense and maybe he'll get helps, maybe even helps Juan Soto get going or gives him the time so you can tread water until Juan does get going, which obviously, as we talked about, he's already done that. So uh Jorge probably is your your DH option right now. You don't want to put him. I've heard the kick the tires on putting him out and left. You didn't no, if he's got especially got a knee problem, he's a big strong dude. You don't want to move him around out there like that. So yeah, he's he's your I need a ninth inning knock. Mm-hmm. I know the dude handles that situation well, and occasionally he gets a, a start behind the plate, but he's catcher. He's uh, don't even need to try and move him at first base, catcher, DH, and, and your late inning, uh, you know, right-hander, right-handed bat off the bench kind of guy. Mm-hmm. How would you line up the starting rotation? So you already, I mean, Darvish has won, but I think it's interesting with Snell and Musgrove. Obviously, those are the two other guys uh, in a three-game series. Well, I'd probably want Musgrove to be game three just because like a do or die situation i think he's gonna give a quality start snell you can make the argument has been pitching better than musgrove as of late as well so i guess it works both ways to go darvish snell musgrove you remember in a three game series you have to get to game three to have to worry about game three Mm -hmm. so i don't want to save my best guy for a possibility of a game three blake snell is the enigma here because He's got arguably the best stuff on the staff, but he's also been the most maddeningly inconsistent on the staff. You know what you're getting from Darvish, you know, 98 times out of 100, he's going to give you enough to to win a baseball game. And he has that one blow up where he gives up nine runs in an inning and a third. You just don't know what happened. He's fine the next start. You just hope that doesn't happen in a playoff series. Musgrove, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a guy who's going to battle you. He's going to get you through. Even if it's not great, he gets you through five or six innings and he keeps it close enough for you to win a ball game. Snell is a dude who either goes out and has no hit stuff or can't find the strike zone with the GPS. And you don't want that kind of inconsistency in a win or go home type of situation unless you're forced into that, which would be a game three situation. Now, I could say that with a caveat because if you go in game one and Darvish wins it and you're going for the kill shot in game two, then I could see you throwing Snell. And again, if the Padres are able to line up their rotation where it wouldn't be in a, a situation of days off, you know, where mm-hmm. you guys have enough rest and you can talk to Joe. I mean, obviously Joe can go on any number of days rest. He's shown it. He came out. Remember, he came out in Chicago out of the bullpen a year ago right. when he was supposed to wasn't supposed to be doing that and goes five no hit innings to kind of save the bullpen. He, he can adjust. I don't know if Blake can do that or not, but if you prepare them both to go, hey. Both of you guys set up to pitch game two, and we're going to see what happens in game one. Then they can adjust off of that. I can see that being an option as well. Yeah. Um, with this rotation, I mean, I'm not saying that they're going to be pitching like they did against the Diamondbacks, against the Cardinals or the Braves the or Mets. whoever they'd face because they're probably not going to. Uh, they might pitch well, but those offenses are better than the Diamondbacks. Mm-hmm. But if they're giving quality starts, that's what I mean by this. If they're giving quality starts, and the offense, you know, Soto is continuing to be back, or he he's here because we haven't really seen Soto uh, yet as Juan Soto. If all of that is happening, how far do you think this team can go? Like, for me, the way the team played against Arizona, if they can play like that against the Cardinals, the Braves, whoever, I think they can beat just about anyone. The Dodgers, obviously, I can't say that yet because they literally have to just do it I, they, I just don't believe it's going to happen. No, nobody has to prove the Yankees aren't beating the Dodgers. No, no, the, the Dodgers else. are winning the World Series. Let's just go ahead and let's just go ahead and see. You, you want to get as far as you can until you run into the Dodgers. That right. that's just that's for anybody. The as good as the Braves have been, as good as they've shown in the postseason, they're not beating the Dodgers. The Mets, as much pitching as they have, they're not beating the Dodgers. Now, when I look at this in the postseason. And this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, at Petco Park against St. Louis is, I think, also going to tell us a lot. But the Padres have um, played well in St. Louis. They won a series. They won a series from Atlanta. They won a series from New York. They have beaten all of these teams in a series. Mm -hmm. The one team they've not beaten in a series is the Dodgers. 
And that's the one that you're going to have to deal with at some point. So if the question is how far can they go in the postseason, the answer is as far as it takes them until they run into L.A. So if that is a National League Championship Series, that's how far they can go. If it's a National League Division Series, that's how far they can go. And I would love to be able to sit here, Ben, and say, listen, they've got a puncher's chance Mm -hmm. in a seven-game series. And we've seen the Dodgers, let's face it, in the postseason. They have been the dominant team, and they have fallen short. 2019 against the Nats, they should have won. They didn't do it. 2017 against the – well, forget about the one against the Astros. 2018 against the Red Sox, they probably were the better team, although you don't know if Alex Cora was doing the same kind of thing there. Uh, they, they have not lived up to expectations multiple times in the postseason. They were down 3-1 to the Braves in 2020 and then had to come back in that series, which, of course, they did before they went on and, win, and won the World Series with an asterisk. So I, I don't know if anybody really has a legitimate chance to beat the Dodgers. I'd love to sit here and say, hey, they have some issues, whatever. They tighten up. Somebody gets hurt. Freeman all of a sudden forgets which end of the bat to hold. I I, I don't think any of that will happen. It's a 5% chance for the Padres or anybody else to knock out the Dodgers in the postseason. They're just that good. Yeah, I hope I hope by you saying they're going to win the World Series, I hope you just totally jinx them. Uh, that's Oh, that's, that's where we're that's, at at that point. Yeah, that's 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 like you know throwing the no hitter. Like we just you say mm-hmm. it as often as you can, so, so it doesn't happen. You know, of course, yeah. usually if you're trying to do that, the baseball gods know that and they don't let it happen. It's the one person who just kind of absent-mindedly mutters it because it just dawned on them that that you know triggers the jinx. But if exactly. we're trying to do, I don't know how I don't know how baseball superstitions work. I just know that they are real, and they will somehow rear their heads at some point. So why not do everything you can to try and use the Ouija board to mess the Dodgers up? Yeah, exactly. Um, what did you think? I'm curious. I don't know if you saw this in Kevin Acey's newsletter about burn the ships from Jake Cronenworth and how he said that uh, during their team meeting. It was probably their players only meeting before Friday's game. Uh, you got to leave all the egos aside and burn the ships. You have to move forward. You can't go back. What did you think of that? I think it's a very Viking funeral kind of uh, imagery that, that is coming up there. And it's really cool. Who did it come from? I think it was Jake Cronenworth. Yeah. How cool is that? Because he's not exactly the he, – we don't look at him as the the verbal leader, right? He's not the, the vocal, outspoken guy. Mm-hmm. But he's a two-time All-Star who just does everything well, and he grinds every single day. And he he and Machado, man, they just – they don't miss games. They go out there and they give you everything you have all the time. Sometimes maybe it's that different voice, that he finally just goes, you know what? I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's the dude who everybody goes, oh, 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 shoot. Jake's saying, dude, what are we doing? You know, sometimes you just, you just need a different voice in the room. Somebody else to kind of make you go, you know what? He's right. And I hadn't really realized it because I hadn't heard it from them. Like, like a really good therapist when they just go, sometimes you just have to say, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Why are you doing this? You know better. Knock it off. And you go, oh, thanks. I, I needed that. Kind so of like really Bob cool Melvin. You could say it was kind of like Bob Melvin, too, like Crony and Bob Melvin. Because Bob Melvin, he's – I don't know. I, you probably spoke to him. Uh, but he is not someone that gets pissed off, at least to the media. Or you could see it in his – or hear it in his voice, see it in how he's looking at reporters and Kevin Acey and everyone. Like, he did that on Thursday night when they got shut out again by a Diamondbacks rookie making their big league debut. I'm pretty sure that got to the clubhouse and well, Bob Melvin spoke to the players right after the game. I believe uh, before he spoke to the media that had to get to the players before they had their players only meeting on Friday. So they knew the urgency was there from Bo Mel. And then you add crony in there. I I think that really wakes them up. Well, Bob Melvin is, is kind of like, he's, he's kind of like a really good parent because if a parent just yells all the time, it just falls on deaf ears, Mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, well dad's ticked off again. So what you have to do is you have to pick the times where you really let it out. And this is one of those times that he let it out. Because when you do that and you get to that level of being that critical, players go, oh, shoot. All right. We've really pushed it this time. Now, now it doesn't fall on deaf ears. Now it has impact. And that's what Bob Melvin has set up with this team, really his entire career. I mean, I shoot, I was in Arizona when Bob got the job with the Diamondbacks. And he was, the, he was really the same back then. 
He was mm-hmm. just really even keel all the time, never too high, never too low, always complimentary and, and always supportive until he needed not to be. And then when he's not, you know, okay, we really, I'm really screwing this up. Now I have to listen and try and figure this thing out. So that's how Bob Melvin operates. And it's been wonderful for this clubhouse. Um, Jay Cronenworth perhaps is the same thing as, as we talked about, where it's like, sometimes you just need that other voice. You don't usually hear something from to go, man, what are we doing? This is, this is awesome. So that maybe the combination of Cronenworth and Melvin getting together and going, guys, listen, enough's enough. We're too good for this. Let's go. Can just take everybody and go, here it is. Let's roll. And if it truly was egos that were getting involved, that's a whole different roster construction, AJ Preller conversation we can get to on a different day. Mm-hmm. But if they're all able to recognize that and put it aside and snap back into being the team that is as talented as we know they are, that's actually a really positive sign. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you hope that these three games against Arizona, it, it wasn't just playing Arizona, Arizona yeah. and Soto coming back. Uh, we're going to see that. I think it's a good test, not just the Cardinals for three games, but we know what's happened at Coors Field these past couple seasons uh, with some of these same guys. I think that's going to be another thing, too. It's not just St. Louis. So, oh, okay, let's say they win two out of three against St. Louis. Oh, cool, they beat a playoff team. Okay, well, what are you going to do against the Rockies while Milwaukee gets to play, I believe, the Reds this next weekend? Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's huge uh, as well. They obviously have the advantage right now. But again, that's right now. That that's it matters right now, I guess. But it what really matters is what happens this next week, these next few weeks. Can you totally just take Milwaukee out of this conversation uh, by winning a lot these next couple weeks? Um, well, Milwaukee's got too much pitching to fully fall off. We know that right. they're they're going to be around in some capacity. And Arizona, remember, they're they're not a haven't been a great ball club, and the record isn't fantastic. But the last month and a half. They've been a lot better, and they've been a tough out for the Padres since 2021. And Chase Field has not been a place where the Padres traditionally have had a kind of like Coors Field. They haven't played great there. It's not like you remember going to Pittsburgh. They won like nine straight games or whatever it was yep. at PNC Park. Or some places they just they just play well. Arizona hasn't been that for them. A lot not as bad as Coors Field, but it just hasn't been a place where they've won a lot of baseball games. And remember the Cardinals. They beat the, the uh, John the Cardinals, the Diamondbacks. They beat the um, the Cardinals in a series they beat the Mets in a series they beat the Braves in a series all recently so they're playing much better baseball so while it's not like you took three out of four from you know LA or Atlanta it means something because they did it on the road against a team that has had their number and has been playing a lot better baseball of late yeah um okay so we talked about the Padres there now we'll talk about the wave because I think it's very important uh, what they're doing. We can hit on the loyal, I guess, uh, as well. Uh, playoff, you, playoff bound loyal. Yeah. You so you were at Snapdragon. I was at Snapdragon on Saturday. That was an amazing night, an amazing atmosphere. I know the wave didn't play as good as they probably wanted to, but they got the win. They got signature moments. Seventeen year old, yes, seventeen year old Jaden Shaw, Shaw with the goal. Uh, Kalen Sheridan's the best goalie in the league. What did you just think of Saturday as a whole? It was amazing. It was really, really cool. Before, before I answer that, I want to get your take. Being in the stands, mm-hmm. what was it like? I mean, how just being – because, you know, when you're when you're you know, covering something, you're a little bit detached from it. Yeah. For, for you, just how into the game was that crowd? Yeah, so I was at a game earlier this year at USD, and that was sold out there. It was like 5,000 people. Um, my cousin, we got first row tickets. I had no idea – that it was first row and I'm looking up, look to my right and it is packed Mm -hmm. of everyone fans. And I was like, this is amazing. And there was energy throughout it when, uh, the refs were, you know, especially like the Westfall call, uh, on the trip inside the penalty box, everyone was pissed off. Like it was an amazing, amazing environment. It was not, I'm, I don't know what it was like on TV, but it was crazy uh, being first row and you can just look up to the right. You can look to the left and just seeing it packed. That, that's I mean, San Diego, they showed out. They, they showed out for this team. But San Diego, man, 
I don't ever want to hear anybody say this is a bad sports town because mm. the Seals opening game, 11,000 people at Pechanga Arena. The goals on any given Friday or Saturday night, regardless of $2 Bud Lights or not, there are 10,000 people in that bar. And you know, Pechanga Arena sucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a terrible venue. And people still go there to watch these uh, teams and, and these sporting events. I'll tell you what, what, what it felt like to me on Saturday, and I talked to Jill Ellis about this before the game. And I said, you know, you've been in World Cups. You've been with this national team. But you, there, there, there was an energy in that stadium that I hadn't felt at a soccer match in San Diego before. And I said, does this feel anything at all like that kind of international competition? And she said, you know what's amazing? What this reminds me of, what this feel right now, 2019 World Cup in France, we played France in the quarters. And it was it felt like that. And she mm -hmm. said, now we're the home team. And it just, it's even exponentially better than that. But just the energy and the vibe, what that was, then that was not a, a game. It wasn't a match. It, it was an event. It yeah. felt like fight night in Vegas, it, which, of course, we also had on Saturday night. It felt like, you know, um, an NFL Sunday. It felt like an event. And it was just so cool to get that kind of atmosphere, especially – for women's soccer, and I talked to uh, Jessica Berman, who mm -hmm. is the commissioner of the National Women's Soccer League. I said, what does this mean, really, for soccer in the U.S., women's soccer in the U.S., and women's sports in the U.S.? And she said, what's so awesome about this is getting this many people here. They've been trying to figure out why during, like, World Cups or Olympics, there is so much emphasis and national pride on the national teams. And everyone pays attention, and that kind of goes away with the club teams. And she says what they're seeing with San Diego now, with us being in the league, is they're starting to get – and they have actual data that's backing this up. The synergy with the national team, with players like Alex Morgan, Abby Dahlkemper, that's translating now to club teams and to professional mm -hmm. leagues. And to see this in San Diego and to have the kind of support that this community has given that team, it's building women's soccer and women's sports – all across the country. It's strengthening everyone. You know, the rising tide, all boats rise. That's that's really what it's been doing. And to hear the commissioner saying that, she's based out in New York, and they've been keeping tabs closely on what we're doing here and what's happening. San Diego community, you've been fantastic, and you're actually helping women's sports and women's soccer all across the country by simply showing up and doing what you do. It's incredible to, to, to think that that's possible, and this is the epicenter of that. Yeah, um, and I also wanted to add it. I thought the Wave did a tremendous job with making it an event. You know, pregame, having the Boardwalk Fest. Uh, as I was leaving, saw that Snapdragon Stadium had, like, the purple, uh, and it was almost like Wave colors lit up the stadium. Uh, they did a tremendous job. Obviously, there was the video boards. I know that was SDSU and the whole thing, but uh, they did a tremendous job, and that was the first, like, event where it was packed because the San Diego State football game it was packed probably on the concourse, but to see it in the stands, that was just amazing, I thought. You know, the Padres, obviously, that's the team. Um, but anyone that wants to say, you know, our city's down in sports or, you know, all any of that narrative, that's totally out the window. If you go to one of these games or if you watch these games, you follow this team, it, it's not just the, pod, the Padres. This city is, they just love supporting their sports team. And I've said this many times, um, San Diego was such a cool spot because here, honestly, you don't even have to win. You just have to show us that you're trying mm -hmm. because we're so sour on what happened with the departed professional football team who never really tried to be a part of this community or win for this community. Look at what the Padres have done. They are among the league leaders in attendance. Why? Because they're spending money. They're getting superstars, doing everything they can to try and win. It doesn't work all the time, but if you show the effort, we will show up and support you. Look mm -hmm. at the Loyal. They're selling out Torero Stadium. They are doing wonderful work with Rady Children's Hospital in the community, doing fundraisers. They're all over the place, doing youth camps. The Wave, same thing. They're doing. They're putting their players out there. They're doing youth camps. They're trying to be involved and raise money and help in this community. The goals are amazing. The, the SEALs are saying, I can go down the list of every single one of our professional sports franchises here. And when you try to be involved and support San Diego, San Diego will in turn support you 
And that's one of the coolest things I've seen because that doesn't happen everywhere. I worked mm-hmm. in Phoenix, you know, unless you win, nobody cares. You know, if you don't even, even if you you know try to put a decent team on the field, nobody cares if you don't win. Um, Philadelphia, they just want to be mad at everything. I worked there. <laughs> I worked to Phil. I know. And they'll show up, but they'll show up to boo you. Yeah. As much as they'll show up to cheer you, they just they just want to see something and have some sort of visceral emotional response, which, hey, it's a regional thing. Everybody has their stuff. This place is so unique and so cool. Um, and I, I just I love I've loved the last 17 years I've been able to spend just getting to know this area and really just how it works. And it's if you want to support us, we will in turn support you. And that's just a really cool kind of symbiotic relationship we have with our sports teams here. Yeah, and I asked this question about the Padres earlier. How far do you think they can get? I mean, this Wave team, they're the best team in the league. They're top of the standings, 34 points right now. Like I already talked about, best goalie in the league. They have the star power. They have a good defense. I know it wasn't great on Saturday, but they do have a great defense. Uh, How far do you think this team can go? I think they can win it all. They can. There's no question they can. Um, And what's interesting also, going back to the – conversation I had with the NWSL commissioner, two things. One, she was in the National Hockey League until she took this job. So I asked her about the Vegas Golden Knights. Remember, they went to the Stanley Cup final in their first year of existence, and nobody saw that coming. She says, yeah, it's absolutely possible for a team to do that. And how did they do that? They got Marc-Andre Fleury. They had a fantastic goalie, and they had a couple of goal scorers. What do the Wave have? They have a fantastic goaltender, and they got a couple of goal scorers. And the other thing is they've got Alex Morgan. And what uh, what Jessica said was they call it around the league the Alex Morgan effect. It's like it's an actual thing or a term that they have because wherever she goes, if it's a road match, if it's a home match, people follow and they show up in droves. And when you've got that kind of energy in a building, it you, the, the team gets that energy. And I actually think that's probably what happened a little bit uh, in that game. They're not used. A lot of those people, I mean, Naomi Gurman's ever played in front of 32,000 people. Right. Ian Shaw's ever played in front of 32,000 people. They got to think a little bit too much energy because you, you you absorb that. You take that in from the crowd. When you get used to that, it gets you back down to a little bit more of a baseline and you play the kind of game you know you have uh, ha, ha, know how to play. So can they win the whole thing? Absolutely. And this is what's so crazy about the NWSL this year, and this has never happened before. Um, the Wave have two matches left. Most other contenders have three. Right now, the Wave could be the number one seed or miss the playoffs. And there are six teams that get into the playoffs. And that's how closely grouped everybody is. So right. it's like it, it's in, it's incredible what they have going on in the NWSL right now. But yeah, it's a long-winded way of saying there is no question whatsoever that the Wave can absolutely win the championship in their first year of existence. Yeah, I'm glad that, uh, by the way, Portland and Kansas City tied yesterday. So that means that the Wave keep that first place spot. Uh, by the way, I wanted to ask here, how many fans compared to the opener at Snapdragon, how many fans do you think are going to show up September 30th uh, against North Carolina? Padres are in town, I believe, against the White Sox. But Saturday, there was the Bad Bunny concert, and it was still sold out. It's um, it's going to be interesting because there is a bit of a history, not just here, but everywhere. where Something's new and kind of cool and fresh. Everyone shows up to do it. Um, and then it kind of drops off. I'd say you're probably going to look at 20, 25,000. It's, yeah. I, I don't think it'll be another sellout again, because a lot of the local sports fans, they have pod race tickets, mm-hmm. you know, they go out and they do uh, other things. So you're going to, you're going to have the potential for some of that to have a drop off, but it's not going to be barren by any stretch of the imagination. It'll be, there'll be a good, healthy and very loud crowd at Snapdragon for that match as well. Especially I'll tell you what, if that's one of those that goes, if you win or you get a result, you get a first round buy. And then can you imagine what Snapdragon will be for a playoff match mm-hmm. for the wave? It's, it's going to be in, incredible. Cause it's, they get right to the semis, right? Uh, if they get yeah, a first win round in the buy, yes. yeah. it's the uh, yeah. same thing as in the, in the um, uh, baseball playoffs right now right. with six teams, first two teams get buys. Um, and then you got the four, it's either three plays the six and the four plays the five. And mm-hmm. then um, what I don't know is I don't know if they reseed, if it's, it's locked in, like the winner of the four or five just goes to um, the number two seed, or if it's mm. the, the last, like in the NHL playoffs, the last remaining highest seed gets to go play the number one seed. I'll have, I'll have to double check on that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, the, I mean, it's great for this city. The Padres, playoff positioning, the wave, 
could get a first round by and obviously in the postseason uh, they obviously have to finish these last couple games but um and then obviously the loyal clinching a playoff spot the same night as the wave uh san diego they're in a good spot an amazing spot right now uh in their sports derek thank you so much for joining the show you got it, man. I always invite and, and uh, enjoy the invite and appreciate it. And uh, it's good talking to other folks here who know, to, uh, who know the uh, game and know uh, the, the community. It's really cool, man. Most definitely. All right. This has been episode 234 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show brought to you by Gaglione Bros, famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries. Gaglionebros.com is the website located on Friars Road in Petco Park and inside Snapdragon Stadium. I encourage you to go check those guys out if you have not already. Um, all right, this has been it. Padres, Cardinals later today. Thank you, everyone, for Derek and Ben. We'll see you later. Go Padres, go Wave, go Loyal, go San Diego. <laughs>